We'll be reading from 1 Corinthians 12, verses 12 to 27. The body is one unit. Though it is made up of many parts, and though all its parts are many, they form one body. So it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit into one body. Whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free, we were all given the one spirit to drink. Now the body is not made up of one part, but of many. If the foot should say, Because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body. It would not, for that reason, cease to be a part of the body. And if the ear should say, Because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body. It would not, for that reason, cease to be a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has arranged the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would, one, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has combined the members of the body and has given greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, all parts suffer. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now, now you, you are, are the, the body, body of Christ, Christ and, and each, each one, one of you is, is a part of it. Of it. If you didn't know me or I didn't know you and I walked up to you on the street and I said, tell me what your church looks like, what would you say? Would you describe it as this country building, kind of nondescript, located out in kind of the middle of no place? It's got an old section to it that's really, really old. It's got a newer section that's now about 40 years old. Is that how you would describe our church? Or would you talk about the people who are inside the church? Kevin and Lori, thank you uh, for reading our text this morning. I think you can tell by that I'm not going to be talking about structures or buildings this morning, but I'm going to be talking about people. You know, the Apostle Paul used the analogy of a physical body when he described the church instead of a construction metaphor, which he used in other places. So he, he could have used that if that's how he wanted to describe the church. So I think it's safe to assume that God is much more concerned about the people in a church than he is any building. You know, today we're going to continue our series of messages called Rethinking Church, where we're asking ourselves some of the important questions that I think we've been forced to deal with during this pandemic. And because so much has changed, I think it's good for us to go back and look at the questions of, is the church still relevant? And what about gathering together as a church? And what about the mission of the church? Has anything changed with the mission if you've been here, if you've watched the last couple of weeks or three weeks, you know that I've tried to take some scriptures that I think help answer each of those questions and, and try to unpack it a little bit in the context that we're currently in. And I'm going to try to do the same thing today. The basic, or, so today's question is this, what will the church look like in the future? What will the church look like in the future? Well, let me give you a simple answer first, and that is that since it's always been the body of Christ and not a building, it's probably not going to have that much change as if we were just a building when we talk about the church. Because we all know, don't we, that over time, buildings need to change. They get old, they fall apart, things they meet need to be replaced, like carpeting and, and other things, and sometimes they need to be kept in repair so that they just function and so that they aren't a detraction for those who may be visiting the church. But the same basic structure of the body of Christ, that is the church, hasn't changed. Because Jesus is still the head, and every one of us who chooses to follow him is a part of the body. 
Now, all of us in this room and anybody watching at home, if you've given your life to Jesus Christ, then you are a part of the body of Christ. Now, there are some of us who are ears. There are some of us who are toes. And there are some of us, we left it off there, there are some of us who are nose hairs. And you know what? Each and every one of us, no matter what part we are, is a very critical part to the function of the church. So I ask you, which body part are you? I would hope by now you know which part you play in the church. And today as I share this message, I want you to keep in mind I'm not just talking about South Fork Church, okay? I'm talking about the universal church as well. The whole church that follows Jesus Christ. And what I think happens is that sometimes we are one part of the body in a local church and we're another part of the body when we're talking about the universal church. Because what I know to be true about Jesus is this. He gives the church, whether it's local or global, whatever parts it needs to do the mission that we talked about last week. I see it all the time. If there's a church that needs more manual labor, he will provide more arms. And if there needs to be a church who will kneel before him more in prayer, he will provide more needs. And if the church needs to listen more to the people who are outside the church, I think he brings more ears into the church. Today's message isn't meant to talk about our individual giftedness, okay? I hope you know what those are by now. But what I want to do is to use 1 Corinthians 12 as kind of a biblical foundation to help us just examine this question of what will the church look like in the future in light of all the changes that are taking place in the world. And when things change in the world, there are some things that will change inside the church, but probably not that many. I'm going to rehearse, I'm not going to rehearse, excuse me, all that Kevin and Lori just read for us, but I am going to highlight some of the sections of what they just shared with us because I think out of that text, there are three areas that I see the church growing or needing to grow in if we are indeed going to remain relevant and if we're going to be able to accomplish the mission that God has set us on. So let's see if we can find those three things together today. The first one, I think, is there's going to be a need for more divine leadership by the Holy Spirit. Okay, I think the future of the church is one where the Holy Spirit is going to be leading it or needs to be leading it more than it is today. You know what? It doesn't take long, does it, to see if a church is being led by the Holy Spirit or if it's being led by some human effort. Human leadership changes. It'll change its message, whereas spiritual leadership will change the methods, but not the message. I think what you'll find is the Holy Spirit is so much more cutting edge than any human abilities that we can talk about. And if the Holy Spirit wants to tweak or change something inside the church, what he'll do is he'll shine the spotlight more on Jesus than he will any human being. Ever been a part of or ever known of a church where they have a great dynamic leader who's great looking and they have a great personality and and that personality then leads the church down whatever path that person wants to go on. Do you know any churches like that? Fortunately for you, I'm not good looking and I don't have a good personality, okay? So I have to rely on the Spirit's leading in the leadership here. I think we see that need for leadership or that role of leadership that the Holy Spirit makes in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13, okay? Camp with me on that verse for a couple minutes. It says this, For we were all baptized by one Spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we were all given one spirit to drink. Have you ever thought about that word to drink, and what does it mean to drink of the Holy Spirit? You know, the Greek word that's translated there, I think, really shares 
how the Holy Spirit leads the body of Christ. It's the same basic word that Paul used back in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 when he was writing about how he and Apollos did different things to help people follow the gospel that God had given to him. Look with me back in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6. Paul says this, you know the verse, I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God made it grow. The emphasis here is how the water was made available by Apollos, but God used that to water the seed that Paul had planted. In chapter 12, it's the Holy Spirit that's been made available to us that helps unite, grow, and guide the church. This all made a lot more sense to me when I found really an alternate translation of the word to drink, and I was able to put together some of the pictures of my mind from an experience that I had in Nairobi, Kenya a few years ago. You see, another very acceptable translation of that word to drink is to irrigate. It is the Holy Spirit who irrigates the church. What's the purpose of irrigation? Well, uh, it's to provide the necessary water for living, living organisms to grow, is it not? And a lot of times when we talk about irrigation today, this is the picture that we get, isn't it? High pressure force of water coming out of the ground someplace and watering a big area and a lot of water is wasted. That's probably most pic people's picture of irrigation, whether it's in a, a, a court, golf course like this or maybe in our, in our own yards where we water the yard. But you know what? In Africa, they do it a little differently. They use what's called drip irrigation. And take a look at these pictures. And if you've seen the, the big black tank in the back of our, our mobile mansion, you know what? Can we look at the next picture? We have a big black tank that's kind of situated like this because what we do is we try to use that tank to use drip irrigation for our plants and our garden. Drip irrigation provides a slow, steady dripping of water near the plant. So the plant can get what it needs, but the plant still has to work a little bit. And as that plant works a little bit, it grows strength and it becomes healthier. And that's what God's done with the church as well. He's made the Holy Spirit to be the one who gives us everything we need to be the body of Christ and to grow and to be healthy. And you know as well as I do that there are some churches who want just a few drops of the Holy Spirit because they don't want to grow a whole lot. They don't want a whole lot of things to happen. But then there are other churches who want the biggest flow of the Spirit that's possible because they understand that the flow of the Spirit, the Spirit provides the healthier church. You know, I think when churches rely too much on man-made strategies, they're just not drinking enough of the Spirit's water. I think that's maybe what we found happen in some churches earlier this year when everything was shut down and people began to panic because they didn't know how they were going to survive or what they were going to do. But those who were listening and those who were being dripped on by the Holy Spirit with that constant drinking of water, there was no panic because they knew that God was going to give them everything that they needed. You know, one thing that I love about this church, I'm going to mention a few of those things today. One of the things I love about this church is there's no panic. When things change, there is no panic. And I attribute that to the fact that for a long time, this church has been irrigated by the Spirit of God. And you know that He will provide everything that you need. Most people are predicting there's going to be a lot more changes coming, okay? And I, I believe them, which then makes sense to me to say that, you know what? The churches who have the best irrigation systems are the churches that are going to be the healthiest and produce the most fruit. So I'm going to ask you to join me in praying for this church that we'll see even more divine leadership of the Holy Spirit as we move forward. The history is rich. The present, I think, is strong, but the future needs even more of the Holy Spirit leading here at this church. A second area of growth that I see needing uh, in the church, universal and locally, is more diversity of people. 
I, I think there just needs to be more diversity in the church. The Apostle Paul spent so much time in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 talking about the diversity of the body. In fact, look at verses beginning in verse 14 with me again um, that was read for us earlier. Paul says, now the body is not made up of one part, but of many. And the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body, it would not for that reason cease to be a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I don't belong to the body, it would not for that reason cease to be a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? And if the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has arranged the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. A part of me wonders if part of the struggles that the church across the globe, especially in America at least, has suffered over the last few years is because we've been struggling with this idea of diversity. And people are leaving, and especially younger people aren't interested, because when they look at the church, they don't see diversity. And I'm not just talking about ethnic diversity and different racial backgrounds. I'm talking about body part diversity. Some churches, I think, have too many hands and not enough ears. And there are some churches that are filled with feet but have no heart. Can you see where I'm going with this? There are churches that want to focus on just one thing, and that's the only type of body part that they attach that, that attaches to them. You know, here at South Fork, we've had a, a long history and a strong heart for foreign mission work. Other churches have a strong focus on entertaining worship services just to keep people engaged and connected. And then there are churches who only are concerned about the minds of people. And so what they'll do is they'll carve out fine ribeyes every week of biblical knowledge and serve it to people. There's nothing wrong with any of those things, but you know what? If we become myopic as a church, then new people with different interests aren't going to be interested in being a part of us. Churches that lack diversity, I think, keep the church from growing. In a place, I, I don't think that God ever intended for any church, especially his church, to all look the same and act the same. If we bounce back to verse 13 in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, I want you to look at how Paul, even in this passage, talks about diversity in in the church, not just the body, the, in the early church, when he said in verse 13, for we are all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and we were all given one spirit to drink. Notice the diversity that existed from the very beginning. Have you ever thought about why there were so many different nationalities and people groups there on the day of Pentecost when the church started? I used to think it was just so that those people could take the gospel message back to their people, and that was it. But you know what? I'm beginning to think that God may have had another idea in mind as well. And that is that he wanted diversity in how people think and how people respond to that gospel. You see, people from Egypt would do, different, do things differently than people from Rome, would they not? Just because who they were? And people who were the Medes brought different ways of thinking and doing to the body of Christ than the Cretans did. Look at the list of all of the people who were there on the day of Pentecost and think about how different those churches would have functioned back in those days. My main point is this, there's no one way to do church. We do get accustomed to the way we do it, don't we? We get very accustomed and comfortable with that. But if God wanted there to be only one way of doing church, don't you think he would have told us what that was? He would have given us the list of songs that we were to sing every single week and what key we were to sing them in. But he didn't. Instead, what he did is he sent us on a mission. 
with some really wide boundaries. And what he does then is he brings different body parts into the local church and into the global church so that we can do exactly what he sent us to do. Another thing that I'm amazed about this 187-year-old church is you're pretty flexible. You really are. And you understand that there isn't just one way to do things, and I can't help but think that's why God continues to bless South Fork Church. But I've got to be honest with you, one of the things I'm praying for is that we'll have new people who become a part of our congregation, who become a body part of this church, who think differently than we do. Why? So that they'll cause trouble and tension? No, not at all. But I want people who think differently to come into our body and to be a part of our fellowship so that we have to determine why do we do things the way we do them? You know what? I think the greater the diversity in any church, it gives us a better chance to really know the fullness of God that the Apostle Paul talked about in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 13. And by the way, I encourage you to read Ephesians 4 this week, okay? Read Ephesians 4 and note how it is that there's unity in the body of Christ. I do think the church of the future is going to look a lot different than it does today because I think there will be a lot more diversity. God's going to continue to give different local congregations different body parts so that they can do more things and not just become myopic on one thing. And I, I have this vision, okay? I have this idea that what's going to happen is that God's going to bring together his church and it's going to be so racially and ethnically diverse and they're going to be united and they're going to be just loving one another and doing great things. The world's going to look at it and say, how do you do that? Because we can't figure out racial reconciliation. We can't figure out social injustice issues. But the church can. And I think... I pray that what happens is that God uses his church to show the world how to solve the problems that we're dealing with today. Man, that's a big ask, isn't it? We've got a pretty big God, last time I checked. And I think God will use his body to answer some of the questions and the problems that we have in our culture. So would you please join with me in praying that this church becomes more diverse? both in how we look and how we think. And then the church universal needs that as well. So more uh, divine leadership from the Holy Spirit, more diversity amongst people. And the third thing that I see the church growing in out of this passage is becoming more dependence. There'll be more dependence on one another. More dependence on one another. I get this from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 26 and 27, where Paul says, if one part suffers, every part suffers with it. And if one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now, you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. If you remember when Kevin and Lori read this to us, this dialogue, this, 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 these verses come right after a dialogue between the eye and the hand and the head and the feet. And there's being talk about that there are some parts of the body that are more presentable and honored than others. What Paul wants to point out in this part is that all of us need to be a functioning body, this, a part of the body that's dependent upon the rest of the body. You can't do church alone. You can't be the body of Christ by yourself. I think that's why Satan works so hard to isolate Christians and to make them feel like independence is the most important thing that we have to have in this life. I'm guessing if I went around this room or if I went to everybody who's watching this at home and I asked the question, would you prefer to be dependent or independent? The vast majority of us would say, oh, I want to be independent. And you know what? That's probably okay in parts of life. But when it comes to the body of Christ, that's spiritual amputation. When parts of the church intentionally remove themselves from the rest of the body, all we have are amputated limbs lying around the church. 
Could it be? Maybe part of the reason that the church in America has been struggling is because we have way too many severed limbs just laying around the church. What if those who were functioning as the legs of the body of Christ who wanted more independence than dependence were to reunite themselves with a lower torso that would, upper, would match the upper torso, which would connect back to the head, which is Christ, what difference would the church make? Instead of having a hand over in the corner trying to do things on its own, even in the most challenges of times, and it's just impossible to do, what if that hand reattached to the arm that then became a part of a functioning body that could help others and be helped themselves? I can't help but think the church would be so much stronger than it is today, but I think, man, I've been guilty of it too. We let pride get in the way. We let pride become that thing that severs us from the rest of the, of the body of Christ. I've really lost count of how many times I've heard people say, you know what, I'll do anything for anybody else. But I have a real hard time with them doing something for me. Ever heard anybody say that before? I'll help anybody. But man, is it tough for me to allow someone to help me, you know what, when I hear that from somebody in the church, the image that comes to my mind is a dangling body part that's ready to fall off. We have a friend of mine who's helping with one of the parts of construction on our house now. He's not a Christian. And his, one of his family members is having some pretty significant physical struggles right now. And, and one day when the, that family member was going to the hospital for a procedure, his neighbors came over and mowed his yards and cleaned out his flower beds and trimmed everything, and he said it looked amazing. He said, man, I had a real hard time with that, Dave. I, I have a hard time receiving that kind of help. And I looked at him, and I said, but you'd be the first one to go and to do that for someone else, wouldn't you? He said, well, yeah, sure, I would. I said, you've got to let people help you. You've got to not be so independent and allow other people to serve you as you like serving them. I think there are so many different cultures in this world who understand this idea of dependence better than we do as Americans. And so one of the things I hope happens as we become more diverse as a church is that we will learn from other people how to depend on one another even more? That's my prayer for this church. We do a great job of helping one another out. Whenever someone shares a need, there's always a resource that's right there to help them. But I'm wondering how many needs we don't know about. And if we did know about them, what impact would it have on the body if different parts of the body were continually being able to help other parts of the body? How would the church in America change if we didn't hold so, in, uh, so tightly to our independence and allowed other cultures to teach us how to be dependent upon one another? For example, what if? it does become harder or impossible for us to meet like we want to meet to worship. What do we do? Well, one of the things that I hope we do is that we look to the Chinese church. And I pray that we will look to them because you know what? It's been, their actions have been restricted for a long time. And yet the church is growing by exponential proportion in China. Because they know how to depend on one another and how to rely upon one another. You know what? We've asked Wing Wong, the guy that's in the, in the corner of this picture. He's one of our mission partners to China, mission partner of this church. We've asked him to come in November, and he's still planning on coming. All things, you know, pray that they work out. And one of the reasons we want him to come is not just to share what's going on in China, but to help us understand maybe how we as a church can learn from them and things that we can do that will help the church here grow like it is 
in his country. I think there's so much that we as a church can learn from other cultures and other churches if we're just willing to listen. If our pride doesn't get in the way and keep us from hearing what God wants us to hear. You know, let me, let me just wrap this up by saying this. I, I, I'm really, really glad that while the world is going to keep changing so much, the church probably doesn't have to change that much. There may be some tweaks that the Holy Spirit's going to make if, if we're allowing that irrigation to get to us and if we allow him to show us what he wants us to do. You know what? I think the body of Christ is going to remain strong and healthy. But I don't know about you, but I want the Holy Spirit to lead more. I want to see more diversity as I look out here or, or, or talk to people who are part of Christ's church. And I want the body to be more dependent upon one another. I know I'm biased, but I am so proud of this church. I am so pleased with how you have been led by the Spirit of God for almost two centuries. And there just aren't too many churches that can say that. And that's why, you know what, pandemics aren't going to hurt this church. Governments aren't going to restrict this church because you understand who it is that leads and guides us and your commitment is to Jesus Christ. So I commend you as a church for that and I say thank you. It, it just is such a blessing to be your preacher and to know that all of us are one body connected to the same head being Jesus Christ. Let's pray just for God to lead us more where he wants us to go.